Joe, who has uh, been listening to your voice, has prepared his heart with your words for us. Help us to hear him. Help him to clearly articulate those things that you have spoken to him. Help us as we worship you together this, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our scripture reading is from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 to 18. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far, and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath the seal. It is robed in brilliant color. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it, if you know. Church. This is the word of the Lord. I have a short video that I'd like you to see. I, I meant to show it a couple of weeks ago, but uh, we'll show it today. pastors on, on the platforms there surrounding all the people who are being ordained that night. All right, gathering brothers and sisters, and let's place our hands on our brother. Joseph Ross Herschel, in the presence of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, I charge thee, preach the word. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelists. Make full proof of thy ministry. Take thou authority to administer the sacraments and to take oversight of the church of God. And now by the authority vested in thee as a general superintendent in the church of the Nazarene, I ordain the elder in the church of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's hear the prayer of consecration. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for Joe Bursall. We thank you, Lord, tonight that you are putting the capstone on what has been a lifetime journey of getting to this place. You have taken in some amazing places in these years of living for you and serving you. And you really bring him back to his roots of that early call of God upon his life that has now been confirmed by this body of believers who have voted him to the elders' orders, and we thank
thank you for that and we pray god that you will use him in south korea and wherever else in this world you send him and we thank you lord for debbie and for your hand upon her life and for what we have seen as they have both grown in you and we celebrate with them tonight the glory of god that is being shown in their lives and in their service to you we give glory honor and praise and commend them to your care in your name we pray special night for Debbie and me and for, for quite a few others and uh, I uh, uh, it's too bad some of you couldn't uh, more of you couldn't been, been there other than the two of us and I appreciated uh, the uh, opportunity to go back and I forgot to bring my Bible up I should probably bring it thank you turn me down a little bit how's that is that better I like to read a story. You're probably familiar with it. It goes like this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden? Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open just as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the, it, the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and, and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees, Then the Lord called out to the man, where are you? He replied, I, was, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the Lord asked, uh, and the man replied, it was the woman you gave me gave me the fruit and I ate it. And the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The 
serpent deceived me, she replied, that's why I ate it. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And the man Adam and his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live, and the Lord God made clothing uh, from animal skin for Adam and his wife. And the Lord God said, Look, these human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life, and eat it, and they will live forever? So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way of life. When I was about nine years old, my father became very sick. He was an amazingly strong man, and it took many years for the disease to take him. But it took him. I was 26 when he died. I have to admit that I, I didn't understand why he had to suffer so There were times when I questioned God in his lack of intervention. I believe the sickness to be a terrible evil. It affected not only my father, but the whole family. It colored the way I looked at the world for a long time. The problem of evil is the most serious problem in the world probably know me long enough that, that I don't use hyperbole very much. Someone else I'm close to does, but I don't. So when I say something is the most serious problem in the world, I really believe that it is. The problem of evil is one of the most, ser is the ser most serious problem in the world, and it's also one serious objection to the very existence of God. Thomas Aquinas wrote the, the Summa Theologica, he could only find two objections to the existence of God. And even though he tried to list the three objections to every one of the thousands of theses he tried to prove in his great work, one of the two objections is the apparent ability of natural science to explain everything in our experience, and the other is the problem of evil. More people have abandoned their church faith because of the problem of evil than any other reason. It's certainly the greatest test of faith, the greatest temptation to unbelief. And it's not just an intellectual objection. We feel it. We live it. And that's why the book of Job is so interesting to someone who has suffered greatly or watched others suffer. So the problem of evil can be stated very simply. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? If an all-wise, all-good, all-loving, all-just, and all-powerful all God is running the show, why does he seem to be doing such a miserable job? 
Why do bad things happen to good people? The unbeliever who asks that question is usually feeling resentment and rebellion against God, not just lacking evidence of his existence. That just piles on it. Have you? Uh, um, C.S. Lewis uh, recalls that as an atheist, he did not believe God existed. I was also very angry with him for not existing. I was also angry with him for having created the world. So I'm atheist. When you, when you talk to someone who says they don't believe in God, it's more like you're talking to someone who's been divorced than a, somebody who's been divorced from God rather than a skeptical scientist. The reason for unbelief is, is like God is an unfaithful lover, not an, not an inadequate hypothesis. The unbeliever's problem is not just a soft head, it's a hard heart. And the good protector of truth, the good apologist, the good defender of, of scripture and all things Christian knows how to let the heart lead the head as well as the other way around. From my perspective, there are about four parts to the answer of this problem of evil. Not going to answer it completely. You may not agree, but let's, let's go and see if we can make some sense out of this problem. First, evil is not a thing. It's not an entity. It's not a being. <clears throat> All things are either the creator or creatures created by the creator. But everything according to the Bible, everything that God created is good. We naturally tend to picture evil as a thing, a black cloud, a dangerous storm, a, an evil face. But these pictures mislead us. If God is the creator of all things and evil is a thing, then God is the creator of evil and he is to blame for the existence. Evil is not a thing. Evil is a wrong choice evil or the damage done by a wrong choice. Evil is no more a positive thing than blindness is, but it is just as real. It's not a thing, but it is not an illusion. Does that make sense? Think about that. The second thing is the origin of evil is not the creator because the creature's Freely choose sin and selfishness. Adam and Eve in the garden freely chose to eat that fruit. The tree was there. They were told not to eat of it, but they did. They really sound like they were teenagers. If you took away all sin and selfishness, you would probably have heaven on earth. Even the remaining physical evils like earthquakes and fires and floods would likely no longer even make us wonder about God. Because those are things that happen. Christians often endure and even embrace suffering and death as, as challenges rather than something to keep you down all the time. They embrace the challenges, they embrace the suffering, but they do not embrace the sin. Furthermore, I think that, that the cause of physical evil is spiritual evil. The cause of suffering is sin, and very possibly our own sin or the sin of someone else. For instance, my father worked in an area that destroyed weapons uh, from World War II. Whatever was released from the air had a bad effect on his lungs. But he also smoked cigarettes and pipes and cigars and everything else. I never saw him not smoking until he finally quit a few years before he died. 
In his case, his suffering was caused both by his environment, by an evil uh, perpetrated by someone else, and by his own choices. After Genesis tells the story of the good God creating a good world, it next answers the obvious question, where did the evil come from? By the story of, of the fall of mankind. All this great creation, this wonderful thing that God did in chapters 1 and 2, is just destroyed in chapter 3. Just destroyed. Where did evil come from? How are we to understand this? How can spiritual evil cause physical evil? How can spiritual evil, sin, cause suffering and death? God is the source of all life and joy. Therefore, when the human soul rebels against God, it loses its life and joy. A human being is a body as well as a soul. We're single creatures. We're not double creatures. We're not a we're not a body and a soul as much as we are an embodied soul or a soul with a body. So the body must share the soul's inevitable punishment. A punishment that is as is natural and unavoidable as broken bones from jumping off a cliff or a sick stomach from eating bad food. Ever, as, a, as a child, you ever made a bad choice like jumping off something? I had a friend who did that when I was about six years old. He jumped off a, a, a porch railing and broke his leg. No big surprise. We were surprised. But his mother wasn't surprised. The doctor wasn't surprised. And I can tell you that when we sin, God's not surprised. The punishment for sin is real. Not a slap on the hand because you get caught with your hand in a cookie jar. Whether this consequence of sin was a physical change in the world or only a spiritual change in, in human beings and human consciousness, whether the thorns and thistles mentioned in the story of Genesis 3 uh, grew in the garden only after the fall, or whether they were always there, but they were only felt painful, uh, felt as painful by the the newly fallen consciousness. Uh, let me read that again because that's a difficult concept too. Were the thorns and thistles in the garden? Maybe. But did they just become painful and, and get in the way after the fall? But in either case, the connection between spiritual evil and physical evil has to be as close as the connection between the two things they affect, the human soul and the human body. So if the origin of evil is free will, and God is the origin of free will, then isn't God then the origin of evil? Ah, that's a great question, isn't it? Only as much as parents are responsible for the for the uh, misdeeds that their children commit, their children commit. We have a child who has a tendency to commit misdeeds from time to time. I and uh, Debbie and I are not responsible for her behavior. So the all-powerful God gave us a share in his power to have a free will, to choose freely, to be able to do what we wanted, when we wanted, how we wanted. Would you rather have choices in this life, or would you rather be a robot directed by instinct and by God? I've presented that question to a number of people, and I've had some interesting answers. Some who are in the midst of a desperate trial say, wow, it would really be nice if we could just go through life 
and have everybody make decisions for me. But most people would say, I would rather have the choice. I think we would rather have the choice. The third problem, or third part of the solution of the problem of evil is probably the most important part. How to how to resolve the problem in practice, not just in theory, in life, rather just in your mind. Although evil is a serious problem to consider, or it could possibly disprove the existence of God, it is even more of a problem in life because it actually does exclude God. However, even if you think the solution in thought is obscure and uncertain, the solution is pro in, in practice. The solution in practice is strong and clear as the sun. The answer is the sun. S O N. God's solution to the problem of evil is his son. Jesus Christ. The Father's love sent his Son to die for us to defeat the power of evil in human nature. That's the heart of the Christian story. That's the heart of the whole thread of redemption through God's word. We don't worship a deistic God who is an absentee landlord who ignores the slum. We worship a garbage man God who came right down into our worst garbage to clean it up. How do we get God off the hook for allowing evil? God isn't on the hook. God is not off the hook. God is the hook. That's the point of the cross. cross is God's part of the practical solution of evil. Our part, according to the same gospel, is to repent, to believe, to be baptized, and to work with God in fighting evil by the power of love. The king has invaded. The king is already victorious. God already won. What we're doing here is just a mop-up operation. Finally, what about the philosophical problem? It is not logically, isn't it logically contradictory to say an all-powerful and all-loving God tolerates so much evil when he could simply eradicate it? Why do bad things happen to good people? That question makes three questionable assumptions. Who's to say we're good people? The question shouldn't be why do bad things happen to good people, but why, why do good things happen to bad people? If, a, if the fairy godmother tells Cinderella that she can wear her magic gown until midnight, the question should not be why not after midnight, but why do I get to wear it at all? Cinderella deserve to wear that gown? The question is not why the glass of water is half empty, but why it is half full. For all goodness is a gift. The best people are the ones who are the most reluctant to call themselves good people. Sinners think they are saints, but Christians who come to the cross know they are sinners. Jesus said, no one is good. God alone. Second, who's to say suffering is all bad? Life without it would produce spoiled brats and tyrants, not joyful saints. Rabbi Abraham Heschel says, the man who has not suffered, what can he possibly know any?
suffering can, wait, can work for the greater good of wisdom. It is not true that all things are good, but it is true that all things work together for good for those that love God. And the third reason is the reason I chose Job 38 as the passage today. Who's to say that we need to know all of God's reasons? Who promised us all the answers? Animals don't understand much about us, probably more than we think. Why should we be able to understand everything about God? That's the obvious point of the book of Job, the world's greatest exploration on the problem of evil. It's just that we don't know what God is up to. We had a hard lesson, that's a hard lesson. Lesson one, that we are ignorant, we are infants. A child on the 10th story of a burning building cannot see the firefighters with their safety nets on the street. And they call, jump, we'll catch you. Trust us, the child objects. But I can't see you. The firefighter replies, it's all right, I can see you. We're like that child. Evil is like the fire. Our ignorance is like the smoke. God, like the firefighter, and Christ is like the safety net. If there are situations like this where we must trust even fallible human beings with our lives. Then we must trust what we hear, not what we see. And it is reasonable that we must trust the infallible, all-seeing God when we hear from his word, but do not see from our reason or experience. We cannot know all of God's reasons, but we can know why no. God has let us know a lot. He has lifted the curtain on the problem of evil with Jesus. There, the greatest evil that ever happened, both the greatest spiritual evil and the greatest physical evil when he was crucified, both the greatest sin and the greatest suffering is revealed as a wise and loving plan bring about the greatest good, the salvation of the world from sin and suffering forever. There the greatest injustice of all time is integrated into the plan of salvation that Paul calls righteousness of God, the justice of God. Love is very tricky, but love, especially God's love, needs to be trusted. So the worst aspect of the problem of evil is eternal evil, hell. Well, doesn't hell contradict a loving and omnipotent God? No. Hell is also a consequence of free will. We freely choose hell for ourselves. God does not cast anyone into hell against his will. If a creature is really free to say yes or no to the Creator's offer of, of love and spiritual marriage, then it must be possible for the creature to say no. And that is what hell is, essentially. Free will, in turn, was created out of God's love. Therefore, hell is a result of God's love. Everything is. No sane person wants hell to exist. No sane person wants evil to exist. But hell is just evil externalized. If there is evil and if there is eternity, then there can be hell. If it is intellectually dishonest to disbelieve in evil just because it is shocking and uncomfortable, it's the same with hell. Reality has sharp corners, hard corners, surprises, terrible dangers. We desperately need a true road map, not my nice feelings. Yet we're ever going to get home.
it's true, as people say, health just feels unreal, impossible. Yeah? So does Auschwitz. So does Seawolf. Let's pray. What a wonderful God you are, Father, giving us the choices that you have, giving us the love that you have for us. We ask that you bless us and help us and remind us of that love and the problem of evil can be overcome by belief in your Son. We ask, Father, that you bless us and keep us from here.